Hi, I'm Milana Weiss from La Isla Network. I'm awfully sorry I can't be there in person for this uh, webinar today, um, but I have recorded this video for you of the presentation and my um, esteemed colleague Esteban Arias will be available after to answer any questions that emerge. So uh, La Isla Network is an, it's an international network of um, interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary professionals uh, focusing on occupational health with a special focus on heat stress prevention. Um, the last 12 years, we have done extensive research um, and implementation of interventions of heat stress protections in the sugarcane sector. Um, particularly in Central America, but um, we've worked all over the world and increasingly so. So today we're going to be talking about what heat stress is, why it's important, especially in the sugarcane sector right now, and what to do to prevent heat stress events in your operations. Go. Um, so climate change is here. This is not news to anybody. Um, sitting here now in, in New York, where last week we couldn't go outside due to horrible air quality, um, due to massive fires in Canada, directly caused by high temperatures and, and prolonged drought. I know that in India, there has been um, massive heat waves that have caused injury and death to hundreds of people. Um, and it really, it's, an, it's a problem that's happening all over the world. Um, this is a cool little graphic that just shows the average change in temperature since 1880. But as this circle doohickey is going around and you can see the trend towards warming where obviously the last eight years are the warmest uh, years ever recorded since research, since scientists started recording temperature. What's really relevant for us in sugar sector is that it's not just the, that the average temperature is rising, it's the frequency, duration, and um, kind of extremes of heat waves. So we are seeing more heat waves that are lasting longer and are of higher temperatures, which is very dangerous for everybody, but especially outdoor workers. I'll just let the, uh, we're almost to the end of 2022, so I'll let you see that. Just to show the trend of the world getting hotter. So obviously the entire world is getting hotter. It's not just an issue that affects sugarcane. But because sugarcane is, oops, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to skip ahead. Because sugarcane, especially the manual work involved with sugarcane, is such difficult labor, it is one of the areas that are most impacted. But of course, you see it anywhere that people are working um, outside doing heavy labor. So construction, all different types of agriculture, mining, um, fishing. Um, you know, firefighters, which is an increasing problem uh, that we're suffering through right now in New York. Um, and then things like delivery workers, warehouse workers, people who are in enclosed spaces that get very hot where they're having to lift heavy packages. So what we've seen in our travels uh, throughout the world as La Isla Network, that anywhere you have these conditions of extreme heat, heavy labor and inadequate social protections, you are seeing a massive effect of heat stress on working populations um, that can lead to chronic illness and to death in the extreme case. Um, this is the, uh, this is what we're seeing in our work around the world, what, you know, the Middle East, Southeast Asia, Africa, um, Central and South America, and of course, um, the United States as well. So this is some of the recent publications that 
the La Isla Network have published on heat stress and the impact in the sugar sector, kind of the extreme negative consequence that we're seeing is this um, chronic kidney disease of undetermined cause. Um, and over the years, we are generating more and more research that there is a strong correlation between um, working heavy labor in high heat and chronic kidney disease that in the context of the people that work in sugarcane is, is a death sentence. But what is heat stress? Um, so people just think of heat as you know the sun and the temperature outside, but we wanted to emphasize in this talk that there are actually two things that can generate heat stress. One is the ambient temperature, temperature, and that includes the solar radiation, the humidity, the wind speed, um, all sorts, a, a bunch of things. We'll get into more detail in the next slide. But then there is also a component of um, internal heat from muscular work. Here. The, um, the metabolic load. And that just means how much energy it takes your body to complete a task. And anybody who's ever exercised knows that when you start exercising, moving your body, using your muscles, there is a physio physiological thing that happens in your body um, and your body temperature actually rises. So the combination of environmental temperature and body temperature is what leads to danger in sugarcane fields. Um, I also like this slide because it shows how poorly the human body does at cooling itself down. We are pretty good at heating ourselves up, but we don't have the capacity to cool our bodies down. The only things available for us are heavy breathing, sweating, vasodilation, you know, the, the blood vessels and arteries um, dilate, bringing the blood closer to the skin, hoping for a breeze that would cool down the skin temperature and therefore cooling your blood as it circulates. Um, and that's really, that's really it. We radiate, our, we radiate our heat as well, but that's really it. We, except for, you know, taking rests and stopping work um, to get our body temperature down. Once we get hot, it's very hard to, um, so here we can go into a little bit more detail, the external factors of, of heat stress. So as I mentioned, you know, the, the air temperature and wind speed, the relative humidity, um, heavy workload and piece rate um, as people are working, especially if it's a piece rate task, we override our body's natural tendency to say, hey, stop, you gotta slow down, you're gonna faint or have a heat stress episode. Um, if you don't have control over your day's schedule, you are more likely to have a heat stress event in the field. The lack of natural shade and exposed land area that causes you know, anybody who's been in a parking lot on a hot day that can see the sun, you know, the sun rays beaming back at you knows that if it's dark land, which in sugarcane, a lot of sugarcane is done in volcanic soil, which is very dark, so that absorbs the heat and radiates it back out. And then clothing. Clothing can be an important protection, but it can also be something that keeps the heat inside. So if it is a moisture wick sweat, um, you know, it helps you bring your sweat out and evaporate you know, the sports, the sports um, fabrics, that is something that is protective and important, you know, or, you know, a shade hat that is a moisture wick that helps keep people cool and helps that sweat evaporate. Those are amazing and important, but if you are wearing, you know, a polyester or thick synthetic material that keeps the, you know, keeps sweat inside and keeps things from evaporating, that can overheat you. The internal factors, dehydration, I think everybody knows what that is, not, not consuming enough liquids over the course of the day. Metabolic load, we already talked about, that's the, the quantity of energy needed to complete a task. Um, health conditions, if you have low or high blood pressure, I already mentioned in the last slides, that when you humans get hot, their veins you know, you're, you, you have vasodilation of your veins. So if you have low blood pressure and your veins are dilating, you could pass out. Um, 
that's just one, that's one example of several um, sex. Uh, there are physiological differences between men and women. Men tend to have more muscle mass, so they get a little hotter. Women are slightly better at regulating body temperature. Um, however, you know, women who are pregnant, for example, run a slightly higher body temperature up to having like a mild fever. So there are different components that are important to keep in mind with um, between men and women. And then of course, um, fever or any sort of virus or infection, if your body, if you are going to work and your body temperature is starting high, and then you are exposed to environmental heat and the metabolic load, your, your physical effort, the body making heat, then you are at danger. If your body temperature is already high, then you are at risk of having a heat related event earlier on with, you know, it, it takes less for that to have an impact on your body. So of course, heat stress is relevant across society. It's not just something that happens to an individual. Um, on an individual level, though, you know, besides having an acute heat-related event, which could be, you know, as simple as being nauseous or dizzy or vomiting or passing out, having convulsions, having severe um, cramping, and it also can lead to a heat, of, heat, heat stroke, which can cause death. Um, those are obviously an important impact on the individual. individual. There's also uh, an increased risk of accidents. We don't function well as humans under a state of heat stress. Anybody who's been outside in the heat will know that. How you, 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 you just can't cognitively function on a high level if your body is overheating. Um, and so there is a direct correlation between accidents, work-related accidents, um, when people are have exposure to extreme heat, the long-term heat-related illness. Um, that's what I was mentioning before about chronic kidney disease of non-traditional causes. That is um, a direct correlation to um, chronic exposures to extreme heat. You know, a little bit of damage done every single day over time can damage your kidney and as I also mentioned, in, in the context of sugar cane workers, it's a death sentence. And then death, of course, um, via heat stroke or during via these chronic diseases, um, like CKD, NT, or work accidents. Um, the impact on society is there is an obvious link to the impact on the individual. You see a decrease in productivity. There's a massive social impact. If a father or an older brother or another caregiver is taken out of the workforce in their working prime, you see a big uptick of child labor and, and children having to leave school to take their parents' place to make money for their family. And then in places where um, they're and the, the, on the social services and the health services that are needed to take care of folks who get sick at work, you see a massive impact of, of, of heat stress on that. So these are really important things, not just on an individual level, but on a society level to take, um, to take into account. And one of the questions that I always get when giving these kinds of webinars is why now, if people for the history of humanity have been doing heavy labor in high heat, and after a little bit of research, this is, these are the main things that we've discovered. One, the work has changed. Um, historically, it was smaller plots. Workers had a little bit more control over their day. You would harvest um, your neighbor's land or your, like the, the land around your home. You, had, you could work in the morning, take a rest, and then work in the evening. With the industrialization and the rise of monocultures, Farming has changed, you know, agriculture has changed. Um, people are, are bust to massive work sites and you are required to work long days often um, with little control over what that workday looks like. Peace rate, we had 
mentioned before, and I've circled it here because there is a growing body of research throughout the agricultural sector that piecework, getting paid per piece, you know, per ton, per, per area cut, piecework um, in and of itself is a major, is, is, it has a major correlation to um, bad outcomes at work in terms of heat stress. That is because if people are required to cut a certain amount per day, they force themselves to do it, overriding their body's natural kind of warning signals. Um, also, if folks are living in poverty and if they cut just a little bit more and they can make a little bit more money, it is incentive to override their body's natural warning systems as well. Oops, there's also, sorry, there's also the increase in research and surveillance. These are populations that historically didn't get a lot of attention. Um, so now that they are, these, these kinds of things are, are emerging as something that most likely always was there, but that wasn't studied. And then, of course, the warming climate, which we've already spoken about. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about some measurements and some research that we did through the Adelante Initiative. This is in partnership with Ingenio San Antonio in Nicaragua. We have over the last five years looked at 4,500 field workers and done like rigorous analysis on what their workday looks like um, to kind of give real results as to like what is happening in the human body, like what physiologically is happening so that we can design the best interventions to protect people at work. So we really focus on managing core body temperature, keeping your body temperature below 38 degrees throughout the workday. Hydration, making sure everybody has enough to drink. We focus on water, but um, hydration solutions and isotonic beverages are also very important and effective at keeping people hydrated and healthy. Adherence, um, having an intervention is not sufficient. It has to be well implemented and regularly assessed. I cannot emphasize that enough. Um, we'll talk more about that towards the end of the, the, the presentation. But um, there is a direct correlation to how well interventions are implemented and the health outcomes of workers. And then behavior change, uh, changing the way that we protect workers in our operations is new. And so it's not something that can only be addressed to the workers themselves. It has to be something that is organizationally accepted as just part of doing business that um, there needs to be an understanding that um, protecting your workers and doing heat stress interventions is good for business. It helps minimize accidents and increase productivity. Um, and getting, getting that message, the importance of protecting workers on an organizational level is, is part, of, part of the intervention and is important for long-term sustainability. So the Adelante Initiative um, took this four-pronged approach. We call it the four A's, assess, address, assist, and assure. This was taking a lot of time to assess the risk, really look at what, what the workday looked like, address any gaps that we found in current interventions and work practices, help assist helping the, the, the mill close any gaps, in their worker protections and then really focus on implementation and success. Aside from doing a battery of biological sampling, you know, blood and urine to just see people's baseline health and their health over the course of a harvest period and then their health over the course of years of work, we also did um, a lot of measurements of the heat stress and the physical effort. We used WBGT devices to measure ambient temperature, and we used um, polar team pros to look at heart rate to kind of get a, a measurement of workload and internal body temperature. These are other similar devices um, that we used to, to get the same measurements um, in the field. So early on, we, we discovered that the average work intensity for three different types of, types of workers, so cane cutters, burned, burned cane cutters, 
seed cutters who cut green cane and, and drip irrigators were the three that we focused on, um, a drip, drip irrigation repair. So these guys were walking through fields and repairing um, the tubes for drip irrigation. So, so hard work, but not as intense as the other two jobs. Um, and to nobody's surprise, we found a very pretty high work intensity for, for the groups. Just to put it in context, um, 100%, I think, I hope you could see my mouse, 100% of your um, heart rate maximum is something that you can only sustain for less than two minutes. Um, so that's a full out uh, energetic explosion. That's a sprint or you know, 100% of energetic response. Um, all of us sitting watching this at our computers, you know, not moving around a whole lot, we are probably around 20% um, of, our, of our maximum heart rate. Um, we also looked at the duration of the intensity at work. So like I said, at 100%, you can only sustain for less than two minutes, but what about the stuff kind of that's considered pretty high for long periods of time? So what we saw was cane cutters and seed cutters are, are pretty high work intensity for about half of their work day. So that's that's a lot. And the drip irrigators are significantly less percentage of their day working at very high work intensities. But still, they have a, a chunk of their time working pretty hard. So we asked our physiologists that were helping do this analysis to compare it to some other things that had been more studied. And they pulled these three groups of people as comparison that are, that are working about as hard. So we have um, multi-day military operations, this is trainings that take place over about a week of time. Um, in the US military, you have amateur marathon racing and then ultra endurance running, which is those multi-day, multi-day races like in the Sahara Desert or over mountain ranges. And though they appear to be in the same ballpark in terms of percentage of their maximum heart rate, it's important again to, to understand the context in which these folks are working in terms of sugar cane workers. So the military operations, the multi-day trainings that take about a week happen once a year, once every two years. Um, the marathon races, those could happen once in a lifetime or maybe once a year, depending on the person. And then the ultra endurance races, the same, maybe once in a lifetime or once a year, because those folks tend to go back for more torture over and over and over again. Um, regardless, these three other categories um, are people who are training, have excellent nutrition and an enormous amount of recovery time. Sugarcane workers, on the other hand, are working six and in some cases, seven days a, a, a week for about six months a year. They usually come from pretty poor, vulnerable communities. Their baseline nutrition is bad and um, they don't have any rest or recovery time. So for all intents and purposes, you can see from this graphic, they are extreme athletes. They are working, they are running a marathon every single day and have no recovery time and don't have the like nutritional baseline to support this like massive explosion of energy that they are exerting every single day. Um, so, and this uh, remember is in the best case scenario, sugarcane cutting. Like these are people that already have protections in place. They are working 12 hour days and have some health intervention. So in the best case scenario, they are already running a marathon every single day um, for six months. I like this chart too, as a, just an, an illustration of 
the frequency and the intensity. So those of us who, you know, spend some time on a beach relaxing, we might get hot and we might overexert ourselves, but it's the intensity is still pretty low compared to what a sugar cane cutter is doing. Again, for six months a year, six to seven days a week. This is the results of the heart rate monitoring. I really like this graphic because you can see beautifully how quickly the breaks help you moderate your heart rate level. So the moment that your heart rate level goes down, your body also starts cooling down a little bit. So um, these dips are the program's breaks that the guys had um, on year two of five that we've worked together. And the two things that I wanted to you to pay close attention to was just how quickly in the morning heart rate goes from low to high. And so this is actually quite a dangerous moment in the day. Uh, it tends to be cooler temperatures, of course, the sun isn't up the nights, you know, it's cool in the morning, everybody knows. So in the first um, year of implementation of improved intervention, we, we didn't have a break in the morning hours because the workers themselves said that they wanted to, you know, take advantage of the cooler morning hours. But um, because of the circadian rhythms in humans and, and just the, we are biologically predisp predisposed to get real hot real quick in the morning. So the, the morning hours are actually quite dangerous. And um, we also know from speaking with some researchers in the military that the most common time, at least in the, in the military special forces training for people to have a heat stress event or a heat stroke is in the morning. So we actually imp started implementing a break earlier in the morning to make sure that people weren't getting too hot too quickly. So this is one dangerous time. The other thing I wanted to point out was at the end of the day. At this sugar mill, everybody has to put their machetes down at noon, but they are paid by piece rate. They have a work requirement per day. And so you can see, you know, the dark lines, the dark dots are the average, but these gray whiskers are the range. So you can see there are a couple people at the end of the day as that whistle is about to blow to, um, to that everybody has to stop working, that people are working, you know, 90% of their maximum um, percent heart rate to just try to finish up the job that they need to do. So this is another very dangerous moment of the day. Um, this just shows the categories from before um, so that you can clearly see how hard these guys are working. Like you flatten out this line, these guys are doing an ultra endurance marathon every single day. And just to see it in this context, I think is really shocking and clearly shows the need to have some protections and to have st a standardized rest schedule that's mandatory for everybody in the field so that they're protected. So now that we understand what heat stress is and the physiological impact that it has on sugar cane cutters, what do we do? Water, rest, shade, and sanitation. Sounds very simple. It is a little tricky, but we'll walk through it real quick here. So in many countries, OSHA regulations form the framework of any sort of heat stress or worker protections that are in um, local law. They reference either OSHA or the ILO, um, which is similar recommendations. And this is the gold standard. In the sugar cane context, it's untenable. It, it doesn't work. Um, I think, yeah. So this red line is the average temperature we measured in a sugar cane field, I believe in El Salvador. Um, the lines on the rest of this graph kind of show you, depending on the different temperatures, how much rest you're required to take if you use the OSHA standard. So if we just use average temperatures, 
by nine o'clock, 9.30, workers would be required to rest for 45 minutes of every hour on average. These gray dots show the maximum temperature that we measured. So sometimes that happens as early as 7.30 in the morning, that workers at 7.30 in the morning can only work for 45 minutes a day. In some cases, these are the maximum temperatures again, by 8.30, work is prohibited underneath the OSHA rest schedule. So what we did as a research team was kind of take this gold standard and adapt it to the realities of sugarcane so that workers were protected, but it was a viable work schedule um, that, that would function in, in sugarcane. So over the course of three years, we tweaked it. We gradually increased the number of breaks over the course of the day. Um, I'll show you a different slide later with the recommended rest schedule. But what I wanted to show you with this slide is that despite the, the increase of the percentage of the day spent resting, the amount of production actually increased. Um, this is true for, for burn cane cutters and for seed cutters. I'm sorry, I, I don't have an updated slide here to show. Um, the increase in year three, but this trend did continue in, in the third year here. Um, other field jobs are not paid per piece, so we don't have that data, but um, it, we know from speaking to the human resources folks that the, the amount of work that they did was not affected by the increased number of work of uh, rest. Also, it's, I'll show you more, more and better slides later, but with the increase of rest, time resting, um, their health outcomes also increased. So they did, they were healthier. Their, the, the indicators that we were measuring, looking at kidney function improved, um, directly correlated with more time resting during the day. So this is looking at um, 20 workers in a sugarcane cutting group. Um, without that morning rest and with that morning rest. you know, So if we increase the percentage of rest between harvest two and harvest three. In harvest two, you can see that based on our calculations, um, workers spent a big chunk of their day above with their body temperatures above 38 degrees. Um, with improved um, uh, interventions and increased number of rest, body temperature, decreased significantly and, and most of the day, most workers were below 38 degrees. Again, 38 degrees is a fever and um, it is the important threshold to keep in mind as you're protecting your workers in the field. You wanna keep their body temperature below 38 degrees. So the difference was harvest two with, with some rest, um, the average, they had an average of an hour and 45 minutes above 38 degrees body temperature. Um, harvest three with better, longer rests that went down to 32 minutes, which is, is, is not perfect. Of course, we would like that number to be as low as possible, but that's a pretty, pretty significant improvement um, that we're happy with. And then um, just another way of seeing the, de the decrease with just adding a couple more minutes of breaks every day. And that early morning break of keeping that body temperature low in the morning had an impact over the rest of the day. So if you want to take a screenshot, this is where we are now with um, a recommended rest schedule. Again, every context is a little bit different. This is what we've developed for Ingenio San Antonio in Nicaragua. Um, again, important to keep in mind, the cane cutters stop their work day at noon. Um, the seed cutters work until 2 p.m. They have different kind of job. They, they cut the cane and then package it. So they have to stop cutting cane by noon and then they can work packaging it the last hotter hours of the day. Um, depending on the way your operations run, we may have different suggestions for you, but um, we don't really recommend working longer than six hours if that's possible doing the heavy, the heaviest kind of labor. And then other jobs that have less kind of, um, uh, that are considered medium workload, this is the, the last one here is, is the, the rest schedule that we've developed. So shade, so resting is 
essential. Getting people's heart rates down is essential, but giving people a shady area with which to do that is also essential. Being in the shade um, helps cool your body quicker. It's It can be you know five to 10 degrees colder in the shade, depending on where you are, depending on the humidity, depending on the climate conditions. But um, if you can eliminate solar radiation, then you are eliminating a very important factor of one of the things that's heating your body up. So get getting people in shade, um, ideally seated in shade is very helpful. Um, an important part of the intervention. Um, the details matter. The shade needs to be close to where people are working. If you have short rest breaks and you're requiring a worker to walk 100, 200, 500 meters across a field, that's not resting. If they're having to walk, their heart rate's not going down. Maybe it'll go down a little, but it's not going to go down um, enough to capitalize on the, the rest period. So we recommend that that tents um, are no more than 50 meters away from where people are working, that they can sit, that there is um, enough space for workers. So if you have a lot of workers working in a small area, then you're going to need multiple shade tents. Because if you recall from early on, like anybody who's been in close quarters with hot people, humans radiate heat. So if you are going to put people in close proximity who are hot and overheated and they're radiating heat, um, you just need to have enough space for that heat to be dispersed by a breeze or, you know, that they're not going to actually heat each other up by being too close to one another. Um, there needs to be a roof flap and two sides to adequately block the sun and wind needs to be able to pass through the tent because that's one of the most important cooling mechanisms that we have. We sweat and then when a breeze hits the sweat, it cools it off and it cools down our body. So again, just having shade is insufficient. You need to have these kinds of conditions. We also recommend having um, water in the shade so that people can easily uh, hydrate. I'll be talking about that in, in, in my next slides. But um, we recommend that the tents be fairly portable because as workers move through the field, these tents need to be work moving with them so that you don't have folk as a situation of people who are, you know, 500 meters away as they've advanced down the field and their shade is all the way back where they began. So tents need to move with them so that they're always close. Hydration, like I said, we like there should be easy access to clean, safe water and ideally some electrolyte solutions. Uh, we recommend that not only people have their own personal um, thermos and wa or water bottle, but that in the places where they're resting, they have access to that as well to either refill their individual containers or to, to drink more communally. The recommendation for heavy work in these conditions is about one liter of water per hour and then one unit of, or one unit of electrolyte solution at about 250 milliliters. It is very important that this is just a guideline, an estimation. Every individual has a threshold of what they can drink. We are pretty good at meeting that threshold. If you're thirsty, you drink. If you, you can't force people to drink more than they want to, that can be dangerous as well. So this is just this is just a recommendation. This is you know something to keep in mind that you know about a liter of water an hour is is what you should be going for. So sanitation in the field is very important if you're talking about interventions. If you're asking people to, to drink as part of the intervention, then you need to give people a place, a safe place to um, handle their necessities, especially if you have women in your workforce. Um, we were seeing that women, despite working just as hard as the men, were not drinking water because they didn't want to have to go to the bathroom. And that's very dangerous. So if you have women, really that should be provided for everybody, but um, especially when there are women, you need to have a safe place for people to use the bathroom um, as part of your intervention. This is the solution that Ingenio San Antonio came up with in Nicaragua. Um, it was a, a 
a pit latrine that they would kind of dig either the night before or in the morning. And then at night, a crew would come in and cover it up right in the field. And then they had a sink with soap and, and clean water uh, right there so that people could wash their hands as they emerged from the latrine. Um, so in addition to, to the things that I've mentioned very briefly, it's important also to, to, to um, consider acclimatization. The most dangerous part of a work year are those first two weeks that people are going into the field when your body is not used to working so hard in such high heat. So the recommendation is a two week acclimatization period. Um, we can discuss that in more details perhaps at the end with Esteban if there's some time, but um, it is essential to, to bear that in mind for any health intervention. And acclimatization has to happen as well if people take any time, any leave during the course of a harvest period, if somebody is sick, if somebody is injured, if somebody is out for a week, there needs to be an acclimatization period so that they don't get sick upon re-entry to the work. So as I've mentioned a couple of times, the intervention needs to be well implemented. If you just have the components of an intervention and it is not implemented correctly, then it is not, it, it is, a, it is, you're at risk of, of, ha of having invested a lot of money into these interventions that are not going to be effective. Um, I can give three examples in three places that I have worked. Um, these are from three different countries, three different operations of, you know, you read, you attend these webinars, you read the reports, you understand conceptually what needs to happen, but then you don't actually, then you, you're you not, um, it's, 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 it's incredible how complicated the details can be. So in one, in one sugar mill, they, in the, in the early days of implementing their intervention as a way to encourage their workers to drink more water, they started giving bonuses to people who drank the most water. So at every rest break, you know, I had previously said the recommendation was one liter of water. Per hour, people were drinking gallons of water. And overhydration is actually quite dangerous. You can, you can die. And I think that they had to send multiple workers to the hospital because they were overhydrating. They were forcing themselves to drink more water than their body could handle. And um, that's dangerous. So you really, I need to emphasize once again, you cannot force people to drink. Um, you can recommend, you can encourage, you can provide the resources, but you cannot force people to drink because that's very dangerous as well. Um, another mill in another country, um, you know, looked at the looked at the intervention, looked at the presentation. And they're like, okay, we're going to implement more breaks, but because a larger percentage of the workday is going to be spent resting, we're going to add um, two hours on to the end of the day. So they extended the workday and ef effectively eliminated any of the benefits of the increased rest because then folks had a longer workday, less time to recover. They were getting home quite late and um, it negated any of the positive benefits. It was actually worse for the workers than, than better. And then in a third mill in a different country, um, the, the mill, the occupational health people at the mill were very hyper-focused on pulling the guys out of the field and putting them in the shade tents, despite the fact that this, this mill was lucky enough to have a lot of natural shade in these, field. So natural shade is wonderful. Um, you know, shade tents, a, a lot of places don't have natural shade in sugarcane fields. Um, so it's very, 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 very important to have shade tents, especially when there's not natural shade or if the natural shade is far away from where people are working. But you don't need to pull people away from natural shade, have them walk long distances to get to a shade tent. That's counterproductive. and. Um, Again, these are just three examples of hundreds that I could give you of the need to constantly assess your interventions and to make sure they're being implemented the way that they need to be to have the effect that you hope them to have. So 
this was just to illustrate um, over the course of three harvests in Ingenio San Antonio, um, we did some evaluations of the intervention design and the implementation. So you can see year one, there was a big improvement over the course of the years of, of, how, of how it was implemented over time. And this is natural with anything new, it's just going to improve over time. Everybody's learning how to do it. So it's, it's, this, is, this is not surprising. As long as it's trending in, in a, um, trending towards improvement, you're doing great. Um, and then oh, from harvest three to harvest four, so this is one additional year, you can see that um, the implementation improved substantially. We helped develop tools for this mill to evaluate their intervention so that they could not only um, understand better what was going on, but address things um, quickly you know, in the moment, as opposed to you know, waiting for the course of the harvest and then looking back and trying to understand what went wrong. With improved implementation, we also saw a correlation to um, in kidney health. So as interventions were being better implemented, people's kidney outcomes were better. Um, so the first year, even with a little bit of intervention, 21% um, of the workers had an incident kidney injury by year four with excellent implementation, that number dropped down to about 1%. So that's pretty, pretty good evidence that, that well-implemented interventions have a very real impact on worker health. Um, this, I really like this slide because it shows you um, very clearly the difference between a place that has an intervention and a place that doesn't have an intervention. So on the right is Nicaragua. You saw this earlier. Um, it clearly shows the rest periods and how um, most of the day is spent below 38 degrees for, for the workers in general. The one on the left is showing a place that really doesn't have much of an intervention. You can see they take a long rest for lunch at around 1 p.m. Their days are very long and the average um, percentage of time that these workers spent over with body temperatures of over 20, of over 38 degrees was um, substantial. You know, 27% of your workday with a fever is a lot. So the folks who didn't have intervention, there was a rate of 18% who had kidney injury over the course of a harvest period. Whereas, you know, years two and three in Nicaragua, which, which had an improved intervention, which showed 6%, and year four, which had kind of the best version, the best implemented version of the intervention only had 1%. So that's a pretty shocking difference between intervention and no intervention. And then it was important for me to show you in a different way how despite resting longer, production actually increased. So the green line is the numbers of hours worked. So you can see that over time, when we started working with them in 2017, they had started to put in some intervention before that, but as we reduced the, the workday to 4.2 hours from eight hours, um, there is an impressive uptick in tons cut per hour. So in just look at the difference in year one once we put our once we put our intervention in place, it was a big jump here. And then with a in, improved implementation of the intervention, that jumped up again. COVID affected everybody. Um, and so this was a weird year all over the world, but still higher levels of, of production. And then um, this was this past year, last year, um, tons cut stays, stays high. And then this slide again is showing site one has, this site has no intervention. They work nine hour days um, and they cut an average 4.75 tons per day. This is in, in Genio San Antonio in Nicaragua with an insufficient program 
but some intervention, they were already cutting more than in this place with nothing. And then with an intervention that was well implemented, um, you know, they're cutting, they're working less than half of what these guys are working and cutting significantly more. And then again, this is just showing that, <laughs> that it's not just good for protection, it actually saves lives, that this actually has an important impact on human health. So I had mentioned this a little bit earlier, but one of the other things that we do is an organizational assessment to provide insight onto how things are managed and then like what sort of barriers and opportunities exist at the different levels of organization for occupational health interventions in general, but heat stress interventions specifically. And this was very helpful, not just to the sugar mill, but for the um, occupational health and safety specialists to have an opportunity to talk to all levels of management and workers um, to get an idea of what some of the barriers were to success of an intervention program because if you have you know people on the production side that are just hyper focused on production and they they see rests as threatening as opposed to understanding the actual health benefits and production benefits then there can be conflict and then the workers are getting conflicted instructions because that what the occupational health team is saying no you have to rest or their their direct supervisor is telling them no they have to rest but then the production team is like no you have to work you have to cut 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 so understanding the way that things work to then target trainings and education along the entire organization is essential for an effective implementation of anything that you're going to do in your operations but um, in this case for occupational health interventions um we're also developing tools to help industry kind of assess rapidly what's going on in their fields to understand, you know, different with, as we mentioned before, like if there's a heat wave, what do you have to change? What do you have to do to keep, um, to keep workers safe? Like, is there, but you know, people in the field can report issues live, you know, this tent broke, we don't have enough water. So management can address issues immediately um, and have, um, an efficient and effective program. So this is something that we're developing now and we can talk more at another time if that's something that's interesting to you. And then um, I would be remiss not to mention that we did a return on investment study as well in Ingenio San Antonio and discovered that um, they had a 31% return on investment despite a substantial investment in their occupational health um, and heat stress intervention plan. So um, not just an increased production, but lower staff turn turnover, reduced absenteeism, less accidents, less money being spent on hospital care, and just the, 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 the well-being of workers in general translated to positive benefits for the company. Um, we, this is something else we can talk more in detail um, at another time if that's something that's interesting to you. So, I think I've come to the end of my presentation. Again, apologies that I can't be there in person to answer your questions, but um, I thank you for your time. I thank Bon Sucro and the Scandinavian uh, Monopolies for, for sponsoring us. And thank you, Esteban, for taking the questions. Take care. Thank you.